Well, good afternoon, saints of God, those of you looking at this broadcast from around the world. My name is Joel Fraser, and I want to welcome you to the Upper Room, an initiative of the Kingdom Reformation Movement. And we'll be sharing more about that in another broadcast. But suffice it to say, the Upper Room is that place where the disciples of the early church are uh, they met and they were in one accord in prayer, waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the upper room is really a meeting place. It's a meeting place between uh, people who are like-minded. It's a meeting place between people and God. And we see at that upper room experience that the church was birthed. And we believe that the upper room experience is a, a place where God is going to birth things into your life. He's going to birth ideas. He's going to give you insight, uh, strategies. Uh, but not only that, the upper room was a place where the church was launched uh, to the ends of the, 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 the whole earth. And so we want to use this platform to challenge believers uh, so that they will launch out into the deep. Um, so today, we will be continuing that message that we began in our first broadcast just a few days ago, that God speaks louder than the corona noise. God speaks louder than the corona noise. And indeed, we live in a high-tech society where there's a growing demand for instant and uh, live information and news. And so we are inundated with uh, a, a constant stream of voices. And in the midst of those voices, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of disturbance. There's currently right now the noise of the coronavirus and the COVID disease. There's the noise of fear, there's the noise of lack and insufficiency. But I wanna declare to us that even in the midst of all of these voices and all of the noise that is around us, there's another voice that is speaking to us. And that is the voice of God. The problem is many people today are not able to hear the voice of God because they are not tuned into his frequency. And then when they do hear his voice, oftentimes it's distorted by those who claim to speak for God yet misrepresent him. And a classic example of this uh, occurred in the account in 1 Kings chapter 22, when uh, King Ahab, the king of Israel, was going up to war. And, you know, they were looking to hear what God was saying to them. And the majority of the prophetic voices in that season said, go up to war, you will be victorious. But then Jehoshaphat, who was also in alliance with King Ahab, he said, but do we have a second opinion? Ahab said, yes, there's this other guy called Micaiah, but I don't like to hear him because whenever he speaks, he always speaks against me. So they called for Micaiah, and Micaiah said, you should not go up and fight in this battle because it's going to lead to your destruction. And so Micaiah had the voice of God. He was the one speaking against what everybody else was saying. Everybody was saying, go up and fight. But that wasn't what God was saying. God was saying, do not go up and fight. And so they didn't listen to the prophet. And they end up losing their lives. They end up being destroyed. And that is exactly what is happening today. We have a lot of people uh, who claim to speak for God. Yet, they are distorting what God is actually saying. They're distorting the voice of God. 
But I want to say this to you this evening. Those of you who are looking, and I'm seeing some folks who are joining in, Sister Roland, Sister Farida, welcome you, Tanya. I want to say to those of you who are listening, if you are not hearing the voice of God clearly in the midst of all of this noise, I want to say that it's not because God has been silent. God is speaking loudly, loudly, even above all of the noise. But the question is, what is God saying to us? And in the last broadcast, we looked at a passage of scripture in Luke chapter 13, from 1 to 5, from verses 1 to 5, and it reads like this. It says, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So what we're seeing here, and the first thing that we said from this text is that we noticed that it was a season similar to what we're experiencing now with the coronavirus and the COVID disease. It was a season when people were experiencing crisis. And this crisis was brought about by two disastrous and catastrophic events. In one event, uh, Pilate had just killed uh, some parishioners who were at a church service. And in the second incident, Jesus told about this large tower falling on 18 people, killing them in one sweep. So what I want us to recognize is that crises are not anything new. Crises affect people in all generations. So crises will come and crises will go. And the key thing I want us to recognize is that as sons of God, we have the capacity, we have the ability to outlast every crisis. We have the ability to thrive even in the midst of crisis, even in the midst of difficulties. Why? Because we don't react to the crises and the confusion and the chaos that is happening on the outside around us. No. Rather, we respond to the voice of the one who lives on the inside. And he is able to navigate us in the midst of all of these calamities, in the midst of all of these crises. He is able to navigate us and take us to safety. The second thing we said from this text that we noticed is that it was a season when there were many voices speaking and pontificating only bad news. Bad news that was filled and pregnant with fear. And that is the same thing that we are seeing even today in the midst of this corona crisis. When you put on the news, all you could hear is bad news. How many people died? How many people are suffering? How many people are this? And so on. You know, we are just being inundated with a chorus of bad news. And this was the same situation in the text. In fact, the, the, the bad news was so prevalent that it even reached the ears of Jesus. And one of the things I want to let us know is that Jesus is never taken by surprise with, you know, the crisis and the situations that you are facing. I want to let you know today that Jesus is intimately aware of all of the crises, all of the challenges that you are facing right now. He's aware of it. He's never taken by surprise. And so I want to say to you is that, you know, we need to not constantly feed ourselves on this diet of bad news. We need to cut off all of these voices that are feeding us a constant stream of bad news. And why is that? Because garbage in, garbage out. If all we are listening to, all we are imbibing is this bad news, then that is going to affect us. That is going to affect us negatively. And so I want to say to you this evening that there is good news even in the midst of the bad news. 
And I want to challenge you to listen, tap into the good news. Where is this good news coming from? This good news comes from the master himself. This good news comes from the word of God. This good news comes from the kingdom of God. All we have to do is tap into the good news. And did you notice how Jesus dealt with, you know, these choir of complainers when they came with their criticism and, and, and you know, they, they came, you know, saying that um, these people who died, these victims of these disastrous events, they were worse sinners. They were criticizing them. And, you know, today in our midst, we have a lot of cynics. We have a lot of critics. We have a lot of complainers. People who would complain and criticize everything under the sun. And I'm saying to us, if we are to progress forward in the things of God, we're going to have to cut off those voices. Because those voices just create a toxic environment, a toxic atmosphere that, that pollute our spirits. And that's why I like how Jesus dealt with, this, with, these, with these complainers and these critics in the text. Did you notice how he dealt with them? He literally flipped the script. Instead of reacting to their criticisms and their complaints, he redirected them to the corruption that exists in their own hearts. And he said to them, he shocked them in fact, he said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And the emphasis is on the word you. Jesus is saying the same thing to us here today. Unless you repent, whether there's corona or not, you will likewise perish. And so the key message, the key takeaway for us in this season of crisis, this season of corona, is not how many people will die. The key message is not how significant or how large scale the, 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 the scale of global disruption is going to be on the earth. That is not the key takeaway. The key takeaway for us in this season is whether or not you are hearing the voice of God. Whether or not you are listening to what God is saying in this season and in this hour. Because he is speaking. In fact, he speaks loudly above the noise. And what is he saying? He's saying it's time to repent. It's time to repent. Because we are running out of time. Jesus is going to put in his appearance very soon. And so, church, I want to say to us today. That it is, stop, it, it is time to stop playing the church and to become the church. We have to arise. We have to arise and do the first works. But the third thing I want us to see from this text, and this is where I want to pick up for today, is that we notice that it was also a season when Jesus was physically present on the earth. And yet, although Jesus was physically present on the earth, in fact, he was in very close proximity to where these two disastrous events took place. Yet, we saw in the text that not even the presence of Jesus prevented mayhem and misfortune from happening. And what does this tell us? This tells us that the presence of Jesus will not always prevent bad things from happening. You say, well, how can that be? Well, the reason for that is this. Uh, you see, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where the God of this world system, Satan himself, still has a measure of influence. So yes, Jesus Christ lives in us. And yes, we have authority over sickness and disease. Yes, we have uh, we can claim the promises of Psalm 91 that no plague will come nigh our dwelling, but equally true is the fact that there is an evil age, there is an evil system, and there is a God of this world system who is promoting his agenda. And so that's why sometimes bad things happen to good people. And that's why Jesus said, it's not that these people who died in the text were worse sinners than anybody else. No, that wasn't the case. They died simply because they were victims of living in a, fall, in a fallen world. They were victims of being in this fallen world system. And so, I want to say to us today, 
you know you may you may be concerned about all that is happening with the coronavirus you know we are quarantined um, lots of stores are closed and you know there have been a lot of voices saying a lots of different things but I want to ask us these questions and I want to probe these questions further is it that the people who are dying from this corona uh, virus and the COVID-19 disease, is it that they are worse sinners than anybody else? I want to say the answer is no. Is it that God is somehow using corona to bring judgment for sin on the earth? I want to say the answer to that question is no. Is it that God is using corona to shake the nations and shake the church as people have been saying? I want to say the answer to that is no. Now, I know many of you may not agree with me on that point, but I want you to stay with me on this because I'm going somewhere with this. So what's really going on, you may ask? What's really happening? What's happening behind the scenes? What is causing all of this? In my humble opinion, I believe that this coronavirus, this COVID-19 disease is not God judging the earth or God judging the nations for sin. And why do I say that? I say that because 2,000 years ago, God poured out all of his wrath and judgment on Jesus Christ at the cross. God poured out all of his wrath and judgment on Jesus Christ at the cross. Now, yes, God does require all men to repent and be saved, but he is not imputing uh, men sin against them according to Romans 5 and 13. God is not holding our sins against us according to Romans 5 and 13. If that were the case, then all of us would be dead. So what is really happening? What is really going on here? You see, God is not holding our sins against us because we are still in the dispensation of grace. However, there is going to come a time when the restrainer, who is the Holy Spirit, will be taken out of the way then the church will be raptured and the bible says according to romans uh not romans revelation 6 12 and following that is the time when the shaking will really take place because what is going to happen and you could check revelation chapter 6 from verse 12 what is going to happen in that season is that the earth will literally be shaken by a series of violent earthquakes in fact the earth will be shaken as never before and this shaking will be so severe that the Bible tells us that the stars from the heaven will fall from the sky to the earth. It says that the sun will get black. The, 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 the sky will roll up like a scroll. And men will be so afraid they will be running and hiding in caves. None of those things are happening today. And so to say that God is somehow using this crisis to shake the nations is really an insult to the word of God. Now, yes, what is happening today with this corona crisis is significant. But the reality is this is really a gentle breeze compared to the real shaking that is still in the future, that is to come, that is further along on God's prophetic agenda. So, saints of God, what we are seeing today is actually the fulfillment of a telescopic or long-range prophetic word that was spoken by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus spoke this prophetic word within the context of a briefing with three of his closest disciples. And, and we see this recorded in Matthew 24, where the disciples had asked the question, when is when is all these things that you're talking about master that you know all of these places will be destroyed what are the signs of these things what are the signs of your return and the end of the age and in responding to those questions jesus you know gave this prophetic word that is recorded in matthew 24 very powerful word and listen to what it says in verse um seven part b of matthew 24 jesus himself said and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these things, he says, are the beginning of sorrows. So COVID-19 and the coronavirus are all part of the birth pangs, the birth pains of pestilences, 
that are coming on the earth. And we know that these birth pains that Jesus talked about apply to our time because several other of these birth pains that Jesus talked about, for example, famines, um, earthquakes, uh, uh, wars and rumors of wars, deception, all of these things we have already seen come to pass in our lifetime. So we know that Matthew 24, the, the birth pains of Matthew 24 are applicable to our time. So this is very, very significant for us to understand. And so um, one of the key things that we need to understand with birth pains is that birth pains continue to intensify and intensify until the baby is born. They are not going to stop. So in essence, Jesus is comparing his return to earth with the birthing of a baby. And of course, these birth pains that accompany the birth of a baby are caused by violent muscle convulsions in the lower abdomen, which are necessary to force the baby through that birthing canal. So what Jesus is saying, all of these hardships that you're seeing coming on the earth, all of these pestilences, the famines and so on, he's saying all of these things are necessary because they are like birth pains that are necessary to bring me back to earth. And why is Jesus coming back to earth? He's coming back to usher in the end of the age. So saints of God, I want to say to us that things are not going to get better in a natural, from a natural perspective. Things are actually going to get worse. Now, I don't want to sound like a prophet of gloom and doom, but these are the words of Jesus himself. These are the words of Jesus. So we need to prepare ourselves for what is going to come on the earth. There are going to be more sorrows. In fact, Jesus himself said, these are only the beginning of sorrows. Things will get worse. But what I want to let us to know, what I want to let us know is that while in the natural, things will get worse, with all of these hardships and sorrows, in the spiritual, there is actually an acceleration of spiritual activity that is going to lead to a grand climax of the return of the Lord to the earth. So, as saints of God, we don't need to panic. We don't need to fear. In fact, that's why Jesus counsels us in verse 6 of Matthew 24. And he says, don't be troubled by all of these things that are happening. Because they must come to pass. And then he says, the end is not yet. In other words, we have to endure a season of hardships on the earth. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. These hardships will continue to intensify. They will get worse. In fact, this is very reminiscent of that incident in the Old Testament where Joseph Joseph um, gave the interpretation to the dream that Pharaoh had. You remember Pharaoh had this dream of a coming famine and he had the dream in two different forms. And Joseph said to him, because of the fact that you had this dream in two different forms, what God is saying is that the word concerning the famine has been firmly established. In other words, it is going to come to pass and there's nothing that anybody could do to stop it. In the same way, the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 have been firmly established and they will come to pass. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. They will come to pass. But is it that we have no hope? Is it that we are to fear? Is it that we are to press a panic button? The answer is no. Because the same God who preserved Israel in the midst, in the bowels of Egypt, is the same God who is able to preserve us through corona or any other crisis that will come upon the earth. In fact, this incident uh, concerning Pharaoh's dream and the famine is really a prophetic picture of our time. And the God who was able to preserve his people through that famine is the same God that we serve today. He has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will preserve us through the corona crisis or any other crisis that is to come upon the earth. I want us to remember that. And the reason why God is able to do this is because 
he is able to navigate us through all of the calamities that we will face on the outside. Because the God we serve, he is greater. He's greater than Corona. He's greater than COVID-19. He's greater than any other crisis that you could face. And I want you to keep that in mind. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to panic. We don't have to, you know, get worried or concerned or, you know, pressing a panic button. No, the God we serve, he's able to navigate us. He's able to direct us. He's able to give us divine direction and guidance. You know, in the midst of all of these vicissitudes, in the midst of all of the challenges that we will face, God is with us. He is in our midst. He is in our midst. And the fourth and final thing I want us to see from this text is that God does not only speak to us in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the outbreak, in the midst of the challenges, but he speaks to us on the other side of it as well. Did you notice in the text that Jesus didn't only uh, give a response, in, in a direct response um, to the disasters that took place uh, in the text, but he continued to speak afterwards as well. So Jesus didn't just talk in the middle of the crisis, but he spoke afterwards as well, and that's very significant. So what is Jesus saying to us? What is he saying to us on the other side of the crisis? And I want to read these verses for us in Luke 13 from verse 6. It says, and he, he also spoke this parable. He says, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I've found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. And if not, after that you can cut it down. So this parable of the unproductive fig tree is another prophetic picture of our time. And I believe that this parable points squarely to the church. The man who owned the field, the vineyard, in the text is God the Father. The keeper of the field is Jesus Christ. And I believe that the fig tree represents the church. So as the owner, the father comes looking and inspecting for fruit. This lets us know that God is very much interested in fruitfulness. And he is never pleased when we, his stewards, we, his children, are unfruitful. God is not pleased with unfruitfulness. He's never pleased with unfruitfulness. He expects us to be fruitful. In fact, it says he came for three years looking for fruit. And that number three there is very significant. Three means divine completeness. It means wholeness. It means perfection. So what we are seeing in this text is that God has given us perfect grace and given us an opportunity to produce fruit. He has given us perfect grace, per, a perfect period of time to produce fruit. And if we continue to remain unfruitful, God is going to say, cut that tree down because I will not always strive with man. I will not always put up with your unfruitfulness. But that wasn't the end of the story because you see, the God we serve, he's a God who abounds in grace and mercy. He's a God who, instead of giving us the judgment that we deserve, he gives us the mercy that we don't deserve. And so you will notice that Jesus intervened at the right time. And someone needs to hear that. In the midst of your crisis, in the midst of your challenge, Jesus comes to make his intervention at the right time. And through his sacrifice, through his price that he paid, he bought us more grace. He bought us more time. Time to make uh, a change. Time to begin to produce fruit. 
And listen to what Jesus had to say to the, to, to, to the Lord. He said, Sir, I know you are right to demand fruit after giving them this period of grace, this perfect period of grace. But hear what Jesus says. He says, give, it, give them one more year of grace. One more year of grace. And I will dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears, then that will be good. But if not, then you could cut it down. I want us to see from this is that there's a couple things here that there is a time when God will no longer strive with man. He will cut those who continue to be, remain barren and unfruitful. There is, there is going to be a time when they will be cut off. But the other thing I want us to notice is that Jesus is prepared to work with those who continue to remain barren and unfruitful even after many years. And today there have been many people who have been hearing the word of God for years. You've been sitting in church for years, yet you have nothing to show for it. You have no fruit. You have no fruit. And God is saying, I am coming. I am looking for fruit. I am looking for fruitfulness. I'm expecting you to be fruitful. God is never pleased with, with, with a lack of fruit. And so I sense what God is saying to some of you who have been, you know, persistently unfruitful. God is saying that this season of Corona, this season of quarantine is your last opportunity to shape up or ship out. I sense that is what God is saying to some of us who have continued to remain unfruitful and barren. This season of Corona is your last season to get your act together to become fruitful in the kingdom of God because there will be consequences. Because God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. There is a finite limit to the grace of God. And then that axe is going to be put to the root to cut down and cut off those who continue to harden their hearts. Those who continue to remain barren and unproductive. God is saying, I'm giving you one more opportunity. This season of Corona is your opportunity to be fruitful. It's your opportunity to arise from slumber, to arise. From, from lazy fear and lazy behavior. God is saying it is time for the church to arise. It is time to stop playing church and to become the church. It is time. It is time to arise because the church, one of the lessons that we are seeing here is that the church is not a building, but the church is a body. And as the body of Christ on the earth, we have to arise and get busy about the Lord's business because time is running out. Time is running out. Jesus can put in his appearance at any time. The question is, if Jesus were to come today or tomorrow, what is he going to find you doing? Is he going to find you wasting time? Is he going to find you slumbering or sleeping? Is he going to find you in a barren state? This is a wake-up call for the church. And so I want to say to us, it is time for us to produce fruits of repentance that are worthy of the master because your redemption draw it nigh. Amen. And amen. I trust that this word was really a blessing to those of you who are tuned in right now. And I want to declare to us that the voice of God is speaking, and He's speaking loudly above all of the corona noise. And God is saying it is time to repent. It is time to turn your life around. Some of you, you've, got, you've, you've had words God spoke to you in different seasons of your life. God gave you certain instructions, certain things that he's been asking you to do. You've put it aside. You've put it down. You've ignored it. I sense that God is saying today, it is time to return to those words that were spoken into your life. Those words of life. God is saying it is time to take it up. 
It is time to get active and busy for the master. It is time to do the first works, says the Lord. Many have, you know, lost their first love. Many have strayed. Yes, you are in church. Yes, you read your Bible. But you know that your walk with the Lord is cold. God is saying this season of quarantine, it's time for you to arise from slumber. It is time for you to wake up and become the church. The church is not a building. You are the church. You are the body of Christ on the earth today. God doesn't have a plan B. He's depending on you and I to get busy, to tell others about Jesus' soon return. It is time for us to walk in holiness and righteousness. It is time for us to build up the altars once again. It is time for us to relay those foundations that have become broken down through sin and neglect. God is saying it is time to arise. It is time to get busy. Amen. And we want to continue to encourage you. My name is Joel Fraser with Kingdom Reformation Movement. And we will be releasing new content every week on this platform, the Upper Room Experience. And we trust that God is going to use this to stir you, to challenge you, and to you know get you to step out of your comfort zone, to step out and do the things that the Lord will have us to do. Amen. So may God continue to bless you. And until next time, we say keep your feet on the ground and keep pressing towards the mark of the high calling in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Stop.